One of the moments when I realized me and Jonathan Haidt were going to be really good friends was I was at a party with him in New York City, and someone was talking about how the most evil motivation that people have is basically like corporate greed. And we both kind of look at each other. I'm like, no, the most dangerous people in history are the ones who think they are absolutely the most moral people and anything they can do to achieve their moral outlook is justified. Like those are the mass murderers. Yeah, sure. There's things to be concerned about corporate greed as well. But, you know, I'll, I'll take a Jeff Bezos over, <laughs> over Mussolini any day of the week. Before we talk about how you grew up, I just I was just listening to a couple of interviews you did. So one on Sam Harris and one on Lex Friedman. Mm -hmm. And I think it might have been the Sam Harris one where you made this point that I've that feels so true to me, but I've never heard it framed like that before, which is free. An argument for free speech is like in the pursuit of truth and knowledge. It's mm -hmm. important, like as crazy as some ideas are like that lizard people control the world or something. It's actually important for us to know that someone like your girlfriend might hold that belief. <laughs> right. And I wanted to ask you, what is the argument you use if say you're talking to a child, like a, like a 10 year old comes up to you and says, okay, you're defending free speech, but I think, isn't that bad? Like, isn't, doesn't that mean hate speech? Like why is free speech good? What would you say to them? that it's important to know what people really think and that you don't really understand the world unless you do. Cool. <laughs> and that right. that is my personal idiosyncratic argument. Um, I call it the pure informational theory of free speech. Amazing. It's, it's, it's very simple, um, but it's weird how, I don't, you know, like it's in the, even in the field of first amendment, it's, it's a, a little bit innovative. <laughs> Yeah. Okay. Well, I'm really interested to learn about your path and how you ended up at Stanford studying law, specifically interested yeah, in the First pretty, Amendment. It, it's pretty weird. Okay. Well, let's begin with how you grew up, like where you grew up, what your childhood was like. Sure. And are we taping? Yes. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> so, you know, it... At, at, at the risk of, and I'm just going to say this at, at the at the front end, um, because we're going to be you know talking about a lot of personal stuff. There is some personal stuff I won't talk about, um, and there are some things in my childhood that are behind me, and I'm not going to revisit. Um, but for broad strokes, you know, I'm I'm the kid of um, a uh, Russian refugee who grew up in Yugoslavia. Uh, my dad's actually 98. Um, and my grandfather fought in the Bolshevik Revolution. We, we weren't aristocrats. We were serfs who made good. And as you probably know from your history, serfs who made good were murdered by the millions um, because we didn't really fit the theory all that well. And so, um, you know, my dad grew up in Yugoslavia, um, actually got kicked out of high school for opposing the Nazis. Um, the, uh, and my mom is ethnically Irish, Grew up in England and thinks of herself as uh, as British, and I grew up in a. She came over to the U.S. as a um, nanny in the 1960s, and my dad came over in the 1950s to study uh, economics at University of Wisconsin, and so they met the only place where you know a couple like that would meet, which is uh, dancing in New York City, and uh, they got married. Um, you know, they had four kids. I'm the youngest of four. I actually um, was premature and, and apparently my mom would remind me, you know, nearly, nearly killed her. Um, and, you know, we were, my dad was unemployed for a lot of my childhood um, and we were quite poor um, and partially because of, uh, you know, uh, the economic situation. My parents uh, got divorced um, when I was, uh, the process starting around when I was like seven. Um, my mom went back to school because even though she studied nursing in high school in Britain, which you can do, um, they didn't recognize that kind of training in the U S you know, probably for decent reasons, but still, um, so she had to go back to school and we were below the poverty level until my dad started working again. Um, when I was like nine, 10, um, so a lot of my earliest memories was really, was really struggling and my mom worked nights um, and, you know, the kids just kind of took care 
of each other, um, you know, not always very well <laughs> or very responsibly. We were all, you know, like a, um, a sort of heavy drinking working class family, you know, and my house, because I didn't have a lot of parental supervision, was always the place that we're throwing parties and would have, you know, people come over for extended stays. Um, and what's funny is, you know, like I'm known – Probably I'm probably best known not as a First Amendment defender, um, which is really more of my career, a defender of freedom of speech, but as a co-author of Coddling of the American Mind, uh, the book that I wrote with my friend Jonathan Haidt that uh, really emphasizes that kids need um, not to be sheltered from every aspect of difficulty or pain in their life. Partially because it's it's not compassionate to do that. It, it doesn't prepare them for handling – um, what life actually is. Um, but sometimes people think because that's my position that my thinking of my own childhood is that, oh, yeah, everyone should grow up like me. And I'm, every time I get a chance to say this, I'm like, absolutely nobody should grow up the way that I grew up. Um, I mean, to be clear, there were a lot of really nice things about it, uh, uh, like having – a ridiculous amount of independence, virtually, you know, almost no supervision. Um, it led to a lot of things that made me much more competent, much more independent than other kids. I mean, I, by the time I got to college, you know, I'd been working since I was 11. <laughs> um, and I was already a cook on Block Island before my before my freshman year of college. Um, so all that stuff was great. Um, but I have, a, you know, I have a I have a now six and an eight year old, and you know, am I uh, determined to be a better parent to them um, in a lot of ways? Uh, yeah. Uh, now, of course, that makes me a little bit typical. Um, Gen X is is notorious, um, and I'm a Gen Xer. Uh, you're, you're a millennial, I assume. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, the uh, and we're known for being, you know, relatively tough and jaded. Partially because we, a lot of us were latchkey kids um, and a lot of us, you know, um, followed uh, – there's a great book called The Fourth Turning that talks about how parenting um, tends to follow this kind of predictable pattern of, you know, um, sort of authoritative parenting, then some amount of uh, overprotection um, and then sort of hyper overprotection and then neglect and then the, kind of like the cycle. Uh, but then the neglected ones tend to overprotect their kids. And Gen X is definitely doing that um, at the moment. But for an understandable backlash about the things that we thought were kind of irresponsible about the way, way we grew up. At the same time, we are kind of like, but there was some good things about that. We did learn how to do things that stave off depression. And what I mean by that is if you want to make someone depressed, whisper into their ears that they cannot handle their own lives. Mm -hmm. Tell them that they – aren't competent enough, aren't strong enough to handle things without help from their parents, with everybody else, you're going to make them miserable. Um, and we've been doing that to young people and then being shocked that they're anxious and depressed. So I definitely had a lot in my childhood that was empowering. I definitely had a lot that required some time on the, you know, the shrink's couch for sure. Um, but, uh, but I do think that we have to get back to an idea of sort of a happy medium um, that uh, we need to challenge our kids. We need to empower them that, you know, authoritative parenting where you are an authority figure and you aren't afraid to parent, um, but you don't coddle or act like an authoritarian is really the best way uh, to parent. And I'm trying to follow that with my own children. Mm -hmm. And so – Going back to your childhood, where were you exactly? Oh, yeah. So I grew up in – so um, I was uh, always – my mom was always very proud of the fact that I was born in New York City because um, she uh, came over as a nanny in the 1960s and uh, she really admired, you know, how good the hospitals were there. But it was also sort of bragging rights. But at the time, we lived in Danbury, Connecticut. So it was always kind of like more of like a technical detail that I was born uh, born in Manhattan. Um, and Danbury was the former hat making capital of the world. Um, it, it's always been, you know, 
kind of depressed since then <laughs> in different ways. It went through different periods where it was more prosperous and then less again, you know. Uh, that the thing that a lot of people who aren't from the U.S. or aren't from the tri-state area even don't seem to understand about Connecticut is it's oftentimes sort of like um, assumed to be wealthy. And it's like, yeah, if you're in a low population density part of Connecticut, it probably – actually, no. If you're in a low population part of Connecticut that's close to New York or Boston, it's probably pretty wealthy. A lot of the middle part that's low population density is a mixed bag. But as a general rule, if you're over about 100,000 people in your city or over – really over about 80, which is Danbury, um, you're probably pretty depressed like Danbury and Waterbury. Um, or if you're over like 120, you're utterly dysfunctional. And and that's uh, Hartford where my sister used to live. Um, that's uh, Bridgeport, Connecticut. That's New Haven despite Yale being there. Um, so, you know, like a lot of people don't really get what it's like to uh, grow up in Connecticut if they don't if they're not familiar enough with it. I remember actually running into somebody at a conference, you know, when I mentioned Danbury, the very first thing he said, "Oh, that's a really Brazilian town." And I was like, "You know Danbury. It, you know, it, 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 it's it's an extremely Brazilian town. It's a, like a Portuguese and Brazilian town." Um and that's one of the great things about growing up in America is like you end up with all these little enclaves of like well, I don't know suddenly how this you know how, how this part you know is is super greek um and the neighborhood I grew up in was a, a very immigrant heavy neighborhood so like the coolest kid on my block was from Peru um there were a bunch of kids from uh Korea from Vietnam um from uh, for other parts of South America um, a number of Chinese kids and some of them were first generation like me who, whose parents came over um or immigrant kids themselves and that part of it was actually pretty great um when when you're in an environment that's that diverse you end up kind of having to treat everybody like they're individuals um, it, because you can't really sort of generalize that much. There's, there's, there's too much data to, to, uh, to understand. But one thing that we did tend to all have in common is almost all of us, our families were fleeing either totalitarianism in Korea, Vietnam, China, um, our family, Russia, um, or authoritarianism um, in South America. Uh, and – Growing up like that, you bet you understand freedom of speech and you, and you don't take it for granted. But I do actually have a kind of funny story about um, uh, Christmas when I was four, um, which is – I didn't actually even realize. This is my second earliest memory. My earliest memory was my fourth birthday and I remember having a paper bag, seeing a paper bag filled with – um, like Jaws, you know, because Jaws was like big um, in, in 1978 when I turned four um, and like an Aquaman doll, you know, like all, all these kind of toys um, that were so 77, but like some vague memory of it. But my clearer memory, it was my, uh, my second earliest memory was Christmas when I was four. And my mother, since she's a you know poor Irish immigrant to Britain, it's not unusual for people who are like that to have an exaggerated sense of Britishness. So you know, like there's this idea of like to the manor born that essentially kind of like you you know you, you kind of unlike Americans, you kind of aspire a little bit more towards the upper classes. And so she had a really exaggerated sense of politeness. Politeness, I was kind of terrorized to a degree with, with the level of politeness that I had sort of like drilled into my head, which makes it all the funnier that I'm a First Amendment defender because I'm actually a fairly polite person in my real life. Um, but my father, you know, also who grew up outside of Russia, but in a very strong Russian community with a really strong Russian identity because they actually thought of themselves as the real Russians and those, uh, those awful Bolsheviks were, were the people who ruined the country. Um, he had a little bit of an exaggerated sense of Russianness, and as far as he was concerned, one of the dominated, dominating ideas of Russianness is, is brutal honesty. You know, he would talk about politeness as a form of deception. Um, and when I was four, I got the first Christmas present I didn't like. Um, it was from my auntie Rona. She got a um, Rona Smythe, um, and she got a. Uh, a plastic drum, like this cheap, cheap, cheap plastic drum. Um, and I remember being like, this is the first gift I've gotten that I haven't been like really thankful for. This is a rotten gift. This is like a three cent gift. 
Like, and it, and when you hit it, it was like, tonk, tonk. it wouldn't even make like a drum sound. And I was like, well, what is this? And it turned out actually, by the way, my auntie Rona was making a joke with her old, old friend, Joanna about like, aha, I'm getting your kid a drum. So it'll keep you up all night. And, but it was, you know, I wasn't in on the joke. And so I look at my mom and I realize I have to be polite. And I look at my dad and realize I have to be honest. And I look at my mom and realize I have to be polite. Look at my dad, think I have to be honest and back and back and back. And then of course I do what any four year old would do in those circumstances. I um, broke out crying because <laughs> there was no way to, you know, to, to do the right thing. And I remember my older, oldest sister, Katie, being like, oh, poor baby, doesn't like his gift, starts crying. And I remember just being kind of like, I wish I had the vocabulary to explain what's going on. And I'm like, it's like, it's, it's a paradox. Like the, the, there's no way to, there's no way to handle this. There's no way to actually handle it. But it took me such a long time to realize that for a first amendment free speech defender, that one of my earliest conflicts that I remember is the tension between being honest and polite, uh, honest and truthful, um, uh, be, being honest and polite. Yeah, sorry. Um, and that's a lot of what free speech is when you fight it on a cultural level is about whether or not you should let societal norms actually uh, dic- uh, self-censor or actually say what you think might actually be true. Um, and as seriously as I take politeness and as much as I try to teach my, my children to be polite, honesty is more important in society than politeness. Um, there's sometimes ways that you can be kind of polite and honest. But if you define on uh, politeness as not even saying certain truthful things, um, then we're you know we're 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 at an impasse, just like I was when I was four. Yeah, I think it's like loving honesty, something like that. What, like, how would you handle that situation now? If I give you a terrible gift after this podcast, <laughs> well, as 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 an adult, I would probably be like, oh, thank you. You know, and leave it at that. You know, like the fact that it, it, I, I, I wouldn't feel as much guilt about not being uh, excited about it, and I would thank you honestly. Am I going to tell you that I love it? No. Um, you know, oh, thank you. That's, you know, that's, that's very, that's very nice of you. Um, if you know, if I, if, if I knew that it was spiteful, you know, in some way, um, and I guess my, my. Auntie Rona's gift wasn't actually spiteful. It was just kind of a thoughtless joke. Um, you know, I might have a, have a word in private. It's kind of like, don't, don't put me in the middle of your joke with somebody else, you know. Or I might just shrug it off, you know. Um, so, you know, handling things kind of more as an adult. But I was definitely I was a I was a worrier um, as a little kid. Oh, sorry, as a little kid, I, I still I, I'm still prone to a fair amount of uh, 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 of worry. Um, but yeah, I think that you know that you can be honest um, as an adult. I do think, though, if you're committed to being as honest as possible, one thing that you have to you know allow for is one thing that and the people around you should know is is like listen, like then don't ask certain questions, like it, unless you really want an honest answer. And I, you know, I, I used to do this with my um, sisters. Uh, particularly my my um, my sister Alexandra, who's um, closest in age to me. No, that, that's actually funny. We all had to have names that sounded good, both in British English and 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 in Russian. So it was Katie, Michael, Alexandra, and Greg, which is Katya, Misha, Sasha, Ikarisha. Um And Alex, you know, who's um, pretty tough. She's actually was a trauma surgeon for years. You know, after uh, becoming a Navy nurse. Um, but she, you know, she would ask me, and she's only about a year older than me, uh, you know, like if if I liked a dress, you know, that she was wearing, and I would give my honest opinion, and she'd get mad at me if I didn't like it, and really, really be upset with me, and but then after a while, I became one of the only people whose opinion she'd take seriously because it's like, no, Greg will be honest about it. Um, he's paid for. <laughs> being honest about it in the past. So, you know, e- even in those kind of relationships, like uh, if you want to be honest, it's, uh, the rule has to be out there, you know. Um, but sometimes, you know, if you don't really want to know what someone really thinks, then don't ask. Yeah. Or getting clear on what you're asking for, I guess, because sometimes it might be like, I'm feeling self-conscious about how I look. Can you reassure me that I look okay? Rather yeah. than like, how do you think I look? Yeah, <laughs> it's like 
<laughs> Especially yeah. for men who can like struggle with like reading between the lines of what the ask is. I mean, oh, and I wouldn't be I wouldn't be a jerk about it. You know, like like it's just like, do you like do you think this dress is great? I'm like, no, I don't. I, you know, I don't I don't think that's the best one. But you know, in in in, in a in, in a situation where someone's just like heading out the door, it's like, oh, you look fine, you know. Um, but I'm not going to say, oh, you look more beautiful than I've ever seen in my entire life. Yeah, yeah, and that is the truth. It's like you look fine for whatever is required of this yeah. moment. I, I wouldn't put it as not a disaster, because <laughs> <laughs> that wouldn't reassure anybody. Amazing. Um, okay, so. Wow, that must have been, like, pretty tough for your parents both being away from their families and I assume they weren't travelling back to where they were from. Yeah, my, um, so when I didn't realise that this was, you know, part of the segue into in, into the divorce, um, but, uh, you know, like, there was a summer when I was five and we went to England for the entire summer. Um, and we did this, you know, repeatedly. So I spent a lot of time. I actually had a pretty strong British identity until I was probably like, I don't know, 20 because um, I used to go over a lot. Um, now I'm just, you know, just uh, I'm, I'm, I'm an American uh, more than uh, – um, I feel even more American given the fact that like I have immigrant parents. Um, but yeah, I think I think it was at times a little hard for mom, and I think sometimes she felt a little lonely, and she missed her uh, her parents, who who she loved very much. Uh, my father, his I mean, my father, his life was just an unbelievable nightmare. I mean, like he his dad died when he was six. He was given up by him and his brother were given up by my babushka, um, you know, to a foster family in Slovenia. Um, it was nightmarish, you know, like, and so I grew up with all these stories told with almost, with almost like a matter of factness and sort of chuckle about all these horrible things that happened to him. Um, but it's always made me appreciate how, even though my life was comparatively hard to a lot of the people I went to like law school with, for example, um, it was nothing like my dad's and I was always deeply appreciative of it. He did, however, um, see his brother and uh, grandmother killed um, by uh, accidental American bombing of Belgrade in 1944. And that story, you know, he would wait until we were 14 to um, tell us because, you know, that that's one where we're, obviously there was no, you know, there was no sense of matter factualness about that. That was something that was pretty awful. Yeah. I can't imagine. So did he struggle with I, like I can't imagine if he was going through periods of unemployment as well. Was he struggling? He tends to think he wasn't. He he tends to explain that he doesn't think he like he doesn't know where I got my tendency towards depression from. Um, you know, I think mine is mostly situational. Like I don't I don't I think that maybe I am. You know, it, it, my nature might be a little sunnier, but I you know I grew up with a lot of. A lot of things that would be stressful. That being said, my dad grew up with even more, um, and sometimes I think he just has PTSD. You know, like the he would wake up, um, you know, in in a panic, having nightmares about being kicked out of that school when he was a um, when he was a kid. And my mom, my mom's a smart lady, but she di she didn't seem to understand. Like he's like, oh, he just got kicked out of high school. It's kind of like he got kicked out of high school for opposing the Nazi occupation of Yugoslavia and he got kicked out by a principal who said, I have the lives of 120 boys to think of. So he had every reason in the world to think like he's, he's a dead man, you know, um, like if that got back to, and then, you know, they're, they're not going to, the Nazis wouldn't hesitate to shoot a Slav. We're untermensch. Um, so, but he managed, you know, he managed to survive with, without, uh, you know, so much so that he was able to get to Wisconsin by the 1950s. <laughs> wow. So he was like a very strong-willed, principled person, not afraid of speaking up. You know, I don't know if the right way to put it is not afraid of um, because I think that I'm a strong-willed, principled person and I, I don't – I. I am, you know, I, I also don't love conflict. I just, I know it's almost like I can't help myself. You know, it's just kind of like, well, no, this is, I think this is morally wrong. 
Um, so I think that dad and I, you know, some, you know, we're scared of different things all the time, but it doesn't stop us. Mm -hmm. So what was your, what was your childhood like? Was it other than like, okay, so you didn't, your parents weren't necessarily around that much. You had a lot of freedom. Yeah. Was it mostly happy? It was a little bit of a mixed bag. Um, but, you know, like one thing, okay, one thing I will talk about that I didn't used to talk about, um, and I was, uh, is that I used to run around the basement playing with a string by myself all the time. And I, in my mind, I was making up comic book stories um, since I was like really little. And I only discovered, you know, later, and particularly having a kid uh, myself that they claim is on the spectrum, um, is that that's called stimming. <laughs> <laughs> and so, you know, whether or not I'd be diagnosed as on the spectrum um, now, I don't know. I'm dyslexic, which apparently is like an, a, a form of um, neurodivergence. Uh, and I was a little, I was kind of ashamed that that I would, you know, play play downstairs by myself, and that was one of my favorite things to do. Um, but that was those are happy memories, and when so when I see my son you know, stimming, uh, it's nice, to, it, it's nice to be able to be the parent that you didn't have, you know? Um, and I love my dad. I still love my dad, but he wasn't, you know, he, 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 uh, wasn't around that much. And, you know, seeing my, my kids stimming and being kind of like, no, actually those are happy memories for me. Like, like that, that's actually a lot of times when I'm in a, I was in a really good place. Um, the street that I grew up with that I mentioned before too, you know, there were lots of, lots of fun kids to play with, you know, like, like I said, it was really diverse. Um, it was, and it was a lot of fun. Um, I, I've never been, I was big and strong pretty early, but I wasn't, um, super coordinated. Uh, but it was, it was a nice neighborhood too, because like everyone, it's interesting that when you, when you look at stories of group cohesion and Nicholas Christakis wrote a great book called Blueprint about this. One of the ways you create group cohesion is by letting everyone have an identity. And my brother always admired that um, I kind of had the the big, strong, smart one identity on my street. And I was like, no, that's not right. And it's kind of like, oh, yeah, I guess I kind of did. <laughs> you know, like, like, like it was it was kinda, it was kind of cool about how everybody got their had their own role to play. And so I have lots of happy memories of being a kid. Um, things related to coordination weren't great, but I eventually became a football player following in the uh, um, American football um, in the um, um, uh, in the footsteps of my big brother, who, who was, you know, a lot of ways like a dad to me, um, who was a great football player as well. Um, well, as well, I was I was an OK football player. He was like all state. Um, and. Uh, I do regret that, though, because I've had four shoulder surgeries <laughs> since. So uh, I really preferred – I started weightlifting when I was, like, 12, and that was incredibly rewarding to me. Like, I loved weightlifting. Um, it was – but the way I did it, it was meditative. It was time by myself. I like being by myself. Um and one of the reasons why I don't judge, you know, like uh, 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 my, you know, one of my boys is like a super extrovert, which is weird. Um, but the other one, you know, the one I mentioned who's spectrum me is um, is an introvert, and we all we all get that. And I loved just going to the gym by myself. I didn't. I hated when coach like tried to get you to lift with somebody who would like yell in your ear to tell you to go harder. Because I'm like, no, this is not. That's not the vibe I'm going for. Um, but if you had told me that playing football would cost me lifting for honestly probably like 20 years um i would have immediately been like you know football wasn't worth it uh, but i do have like i have really happy memories of funny things i have i have wonderful memories of sneaking out to the danbury public library you know on sundays um because i didn't want people to know i like uh, even though i had the 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 identity in my my neighborhood as being smart at school I didn't necessarily want people to know I was smart. Um, and so I would kind of, I wanted them to know I was big and tough. Um, and I hid that. But 
I didn't tell them that on weekends I would go to the library and I'd I, what I loved in particular were all those um, microfilm machines where you could re read old newspapers because I loved reading history as it was actually happening. You know, like like I found that so cool and realizing like things people got wrong like when something was happening like right at that time. Uh, and oh, I probably should have mentioned this because it's really important to, to, to my identity. Huge comic book fan. And uh, since I was the youngest of four and all the other kids worked, that meant that uh, it was often the case that, you know, their change would fall out of their pockets. And if any time I could get two quarters and a dime, I would be taking it running down to the uh, corner store to get myself a comic book because you could buy them there back then. And, you know, like I've always – loved comic books um they uh they've uh, and i only kind of like became too cool for them in, in college and maybe to some degree law school and honestly like after a couple of years of that i was like you know what i'm back to reading these again um and they, they, they've enriched my life amazing so do you have an early memory of you realizing like you're principled and strong-willed and want to speak to what's true <laughs> um, I was a pacifist. Um, I had a strong belief against violence. Uh, but like I said, I was big and strong. Um, so on multiple occasions, I would – so there was this one kid, uh, Mikey Barrett, um, a white kid um, who had a tendency to – who uh, whose parents were – well, anyway. Um, uh, and – he had a tendency to kind of like mouth off a little bit to other kids, but he was like this scrawny little little dude. And there was this kid Carlos uh, from Puerto Rico who he mouthed off to, and I was bigger than Carlos, uh, but uh, and Carlos really wanted to beat the you know, beat, beat the hell out of Mikey for something he said, which you know I don't didn't blame Carlos for being angry, but I couldn't let him you know beat up Mikey. So uh, I just let Carlos hit me a couple of times um, and then tried to pretend like it didn't hurt um, because I, I, I was willing to be hit, but I wasn't willing to hit. I did this again, you know, probably in seventh grade with this kid who was like probably about to hear to me, but was really hurting, you know, and was really angry. And I let him punch me twice, you know, right on the bridge of the nose um, to make the point that he couldn't hurt me. Did it hurt? Yes. Um, did I let him know that? No. I just picked him up and said, stop it. Um, and he stopped it. Why uh, was he hitting you? He was just angry. Something. Uh, something dumb. I don't, I don't even remember why. Um, I will say that after that, I had had enough. And I, I remember becoming a uh, – what I – told my dad an anti-bully bully and I would beat up kids who beat up other kids. Now, I was proud of this. And I and yeah, to be clear, sometimes I did do that. Sometimes like I, I would see like an older kid picking on a little kid and I'd be like, I'm not having that, you know. And sometimes it was as simple as putting someone in a headlock kind of thing. Um, but I remember telling my dad this proudly and he said, my son, is that not just another kind of bully? It's like <gasps> – uh, and I was like, he's right. I am not always doing this with the best of motivations. I mean, it, that's what it started as. But sometimes, you know, you you were just teaching people not to be you know, not to be rude to you. Now, of course, I grew up in an environment where it's kind of like people tended to be pretty nice to each other because otherwise, like the like if you're actually being a jerk, it wasn't a we uh, an unexpected consequence. You might end up getting punched. Um, but yeah, I, I got in, I got in a fair number of fights, you know, as a kid, but realizing my dad saying that to me, you know, that, that was really like, oh my God, you're, you're right. Um, this is, this is me, uh, thinking I'm being morally superior, but also give, you know, I was being, I was morally superior when I was willing to take punches. Um, but it was in some ways kind of cowardly to have to give them. Huh. Now, now, I will say one thing, though, that I got to do that was kind of a surprise at how wonderful it felt was when I was at my absolute physically biggest, when, I, when I'd been um, – and I would never be that big and muscly again because, you know, I, I would end up having my first shoulder surgery the next year uh, thanks to football. 
And I got to be a bouncer a couple of times. And you would think that a lot of people don't understand what bouncers are supposed to do would think. It's like, well, that's aggressive. It's like, no, not if you're a good one. A good bouncer is the big, nice guy who, when you're about to get into a fight, steps in the way and says, hey, you know, don't do this. Or I'll have to kick you out. And you like him, so you don't want to hit him. He's bigger than you, so you don't want to hit him. Um, and you give a chance for people to do, to de-escalate. And it was something where I was kind of like, when I got good at it, I was kind of like, oh, this is kind of kind of great. And I remember actually watching a show um, when I was in, in London one time that was talking about bouncers. And it was kind of talking about the good bouncers versus the bad bouncers. And the bad bouncers are the ones who want to fight. Um, the good bouncers are the ones who are kind of like, buddy, listen, like, um, I think you got to go. Uh, and give people a chance to de-escalate. So I, I didn't expect to feel like this empowered peacemaker as a, as a bouncer, but like that was really, I, you know, I obviously never got into a fight as a bouncer. Um, and generally people like the opportunity to get out of a fight. Amazing. Yes, it's like, it's like being a good dom. Like people think dominance is always bad, but it's like the dog trainer, because of the energy of the dog trainer, the the dog gets to relax. Like the dog is happy to relax and become submissive because it doesn't have to be confused about its place anymore. Being a good dumb. I've only heard that in other contexts. But... <laughs> uh, yeah. Yeah. But it's so, it's so interesting because these dynamics are at play all the time, but we're like scared to talk about, especially with like women. It's like, we just rather pretend it doesn't exist, but it's like power dynamics are happening all the time and can happen like um yeah without without violence yeah no absolutely cool oh okay. actually well, and, and with and with regards to women that was one downside of um being raised in a family where my dad was kind of out of the picture and i was mostly raised by girls um is that if you're the little brother all girls tell you are their complaints about men well i mean it depends on the girl but like definitely in my family all they would tell you was kind of the complaints about boys actually at that age and never about the ones that they actually like. So I definitely grew up with a sense, um, at least in high school, that men are just a burden on women and they never like attention from them. And it's always negative and that you should feel apologetic to a degree for living. Um, and not great for dating in high school, uh, clearly. Um, got entirely over it when I got to college, uh, when I realized it was all BS. But uh, but it was funny, you know, like to realize it's like, oh, I was just hearing part of the story. My sisters were never going to tell me about like the one time that boy was like super charming or that one boy, one time he was super confident and that was great. They were like, oh, that guy was so, so such an arrogant jerk, you know. Um I probably should have maybe asked more often about like, so what do you actually, what do girls actually like? Because I I basically got a completely inaccurate lesson um, from a one-sided explanation to me. Got it. Yeah. No, men are great. We love men. This is a very <laughs> pro-men space. And I feel like a lot of men need to hear this now because that's kind of in the consciousness that are like men are bad. And yeah, that's not... There's no black and white. That's your. That's my favorite quote that you guys have in Coddling of the American Mind, that, What's that? Solzhenitsyn quote about evil cuts through the heart of every one of us who are Absolutely. my to cut a piece of my own heart. Like there's no bad people, that, but that's like good and evil within all of us, whatever. It's way more nuanced. But love, love and light is within every human as well without sounding too cringe or something. Okay, but that made me think when you're talking about the anti-bully bully, that made me think of like the stuff on campus or like the cancel culture stuff. It's kind of Absolutely. like in the spirit or even now what's happening with the election, this or what happened with the election, so, some of this rhetoric around, you know, the moral superiority of like yeah. I need to save everyone from themselves because everyone's obviously sucks and I'm like better than them, you know, that kind of feeling yeah so my uh uh my second to last book was coddling of the american mind with height um my most recent book is called canceling of the american mind with my um a, a brilliant young woman named ricky schlott um uh which is about cancel culture 
And cancel culture is all about seeing yourself as an anti-bully bully. You know, like the kind of person who you're bad and therefore whatever tactics I use to get you kicked out of your job, to ruin your life, it's all justified um, because I'm the good person. I'm the virtuous person. And I remember actually one of the, one of the moments when I realized me and Jonathan Haidt were going to be really good friends um, was I was at a party with him and someone was talking about how um, it was in New York City and someone was talking about how kind of like, well, the, you know, the most evil motivation that people have, you know, is, is, is basically like corporate greed. And we both kind of look at each other. I'm like, no, the most dangerous people in history are the ones who think they're absolutely the most moral people and anything they can do to achieve their moral outlook is justified. Like those are the mass murderers. Like, um, yeah, sure. There's things to be concerned about corporate greed as well. Um, but you know, I'll, I'll take a Jeff Bezos over, <laughs> over Mussolini any day of the week. Um, but generally like one of the most dangerous things and one of the, and this is one of the reasons why I come back to epistemic humility. So often the idea of like intellectual humility of, of not just, and I call it epistemic because I don't just mean, uh, knowing the limitations of what, you know, it's knowing the limitations of what can be known. Um, and so I use the slightly fancier term to get, a, get, get across a little bit of a, a, of a more serious point. Now, I got, you know, humility kind of beat into me as a kid um, and probably had an excessive amount of it uh, that, that was unhealthy. But I do think that, you know, democracy without a little bit of checking yourself um, can be <sighs> – awful <laughs> like, like because you end up in this this the situation where unless you actually have sayings like we we did when i was a kid like to each their own everyone's entitled to their opinion to all of these things that indicate that are ways of saying within a democratic society that you should check your own sense of superiority um we you know uh we we can be quite nasty to each other um but I worry, and we and we emphasize this in canceling the American mind, that I mean, Ricky grew up never hearing these kind of sayings, um, and of course she didn't, because like she grew up in an environment that was much more, well, the world's broken into a simplistic story of good versus evil. There are the um, the evil oppressors, and there there are the um, benighted oppressed, and that it's just that simple. Um, and of course, it's not that simple. Humans are humans and humans are, you know, people always ask, like, what's well, basic human nature? My, my answer is always, well, there's nothing basic about humans. We're, 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 we're complex uh, beasties. Mm -hmm. And but without having this idea that like, you know, like, uh, uh, you know, another good one that was said all the time when I was a kid was, who am I to judge? It, it, it's a beautiful sentiment, really, because it's just kind of like. Are you the one person who's perfectly virtuous? But we act like that a lot in cancel culture. We act like that a lot online, partially because people don't know the nastier or more selfish things that we've done um, in our lifetimes. Yeah. And then I think forgiveness is another one to add to that. And redemption. Absolutely. Yeah. Mm. And then even... I can get like it's like we can all fall into these traps and just knowing that because even I can get in the trap of like oh like cancelling people is so bad but then I become a thing of like oh if you're like spreading hatred or cancelling people then you're like bad and then that's me putting myself above someone again without being like acceptance for that person and not like dividing again because yeah it just creates more division of like those people over there are doing that. It, 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 it is tough because like when people talk about canceling the cancelers, um, I don't like it as a sort of fight fire with fire tactic. But I've seen also that argument be used that essentially, oh, you're not in favor of cancel culture? Well, um, then why are you saying that we should get rid of these departments that police speech? And it's kind of like – because they police speech, like because they're they're part of the problem here. When you actually have formal structures, and colleges have a lot of these formal structures that allow you to report people for wrong think or wrong speech, like that's something that has to really be addressed. Mm, yeah, 
But yeah, so then I think it's like sticking with the values, which is like what you're doing, protecting the values. And it's like, this is how we can live in this society where we have, you know, we have a democracy. We have like, Pete, you can walk down the street, you can criticise the government without fear of like being arrested or whatever. But it's like, you can't take that for granted. There are things in place that are protecting that and let's protect those things. Agreed. And Okay, so how did you become, I know we have to wrap up in a sec, but how did you become interested in the First Amendment to the point that when you're at Stanford, that was like your full focus? Uh, well, you know, um, I grew up with it, like I said, with uh, as being, we all took free freedom of speech seriously as, as first generation kids. Um, you know, I was lucky enough to grow up in the, uh, as a little kid in the 80s and as a, you know, burgeoning adult in the 90s, a time when increasingly even like different sides of the political spectrum agreed on the First Amendment and freedom of speech. Not universally, but a lot of us did. Um, and then I got to uh, – so I visited one one college. Um, I was actually thinking – I was a, as I mentioned, I was a cook, you know, uh, by the time I went to college. So I was like, I can just stay as a cook, you know, like the, the um, this is good money. Um, so I was a little ambivalent about going to college. Uh, but I visited one college, American University in D.C. Um, they offered me – a free ride. I did a tour there and they're kind of like, what, what are your grades and, and um, SATs? I'm like this. And they're like, okay, here's your, here's your financial aid package. I'm like, I haven't applied yet. Um, but they basically said I'd be accepted. So I went to American um, and I was a student journalist during that time. Um, and that really gets you radicalized in the direction of freedom of speech because you realize that people come into your office all the time. They want you to punish this journalist or retract that story, not because it isn't true, but because it made them mad. And the wheels turn and they figure out some justification for um, for trying to punish them, uh, for saying – like whatever the magic words they have to say, they'll, they'll learn to say them. And that's what made me realize, oh, wow, like the protectors of free speech have to be really broad because frankly, we're really good at arguing against freedom of speech in our own heads. Like when we don't like the speech, we come up with justifications instantly about why – or at least very fast – about why we think this person should be punished. So that got me, you know, more radicalized in the direction of freedom of speech. Um, I always complain about American, though, when I'm whenever I'm given the chance, because I went there as a scholarship student. They eroded my scholarship money so badly by my junior year that I thought I was going to have to drop out. For the first time ever, my mom had to take out a loan, which I was horrified about. Um, and then I wrote about it as a student journalist, as being did American University bait and switch me. And then they gave all my funding back in my senior year, um, which always kind of felt a little bit like a confession. That's why I don't say, you know, I'm not very warm and fuzzy about American. But then in my senior year, there was the Communications Decency Act, an attempt to ban indecency, indecency on the Internet. Way too broad. Kind of like the idea that you could ban something that's – we're not talking about, you know, obscenity. We're talking about something much more like crudeness is basically what indecency means. Um and that got me even more radicalized the direction of freedom of speech, so much so that I decided to apply to a handful of law schools just to do freedom of speech work. Mm -hmm. uh, and I got into Stanford, which was my – the school I most wanted to go to because it was also – you know, it's, it's impossible to convince a dude from Danbury that there's a good school in, uh, in New Haven, for example. <laughs> um, so I went to Stanford. Honestly, like after being um, a more serious student in undergrad, I, you know, show up at Stanford and I'm like, I just had the time of my life. Like I, I just had the coolest friends. I hung out in San Francisco all the time. I had a blast in law school, but I took every single class they offered on freedom of speech. And when I ran out of classes, I did an internship at the ACLU of Northern California uh, and I did six credits on censorship in the Tudor dynasty because that's a good way to get into the issue of censorship technology, especially the printing press. Um, and so I, I put all my eggs in the First Amendment basket because it was a real passion of mine. Um, and that was a little crazy because I, I was going in the direction of nonprofit law um, at a time. This was Silicon Valley, you know, during the first tech boom. Um, I, you know, if I was, I don't know. Uh, not a typical like l lower income kid who oftentimes go. We tend to go into uh, cause based stuff. 
um, I would have just tried to make a ton of money and I'd be, you know, I'd probably be a billionaire right now. Um, but I wanted to do this work and uh, because I was so well known at Stanford for doing this and kind of excelling in it, when Harvey Silverglate, the co-founder of FIRE, uh, the more left-leaning of the two co-founders, uh, asked Kathleen Sullivan, who is the dean of the law school, who she'd recommend um, to be the first legal director of this brand new nonprofit called the Foundation for Individual Rights in Education, I she recommended me by he rec, she recommended me by name, which remains the greatest compliment I've ever received in my life. So I started at Fire, you know, in two thousand one. Uh, I became president of uh, first legal director. I became president in two thousand six. Um, and even though I got scoffed at quite a bit for hyper-specializing in, in First Amendment and freedom of speech, it's what I've been able to do for my entire career. Amazing. Who scoffed at you? Um, it was kind of funny. Like Stanford is a place where there is kind of a bit of a premium on at least acting like you're more mellow than you actually are. Um Whereas when I was at NYU, um, when I was doing – when I was working at a law firm my first summer, um, I uh, – a bunch of the NYU students were kind of like, First Amendment? You're free speech? Like what are you doing? Like there's no jobs in that. There's no way to make money doing that. And of course, you know, when I started working at FIRE, I was making I think $50,000 a year, which – was about a third of what I had been offered to to make at the law firm. Um, and I remember, you know, being like, yeah, you know what? But compared to the way I grew up, you know what kind of people make $50,000 a year? Rich people. <laughs> so uh, so that's, you know, like, that, uh, be, being from a poor background was always one of my superpowers and having jobs since I was little was also one of them. Um, you know, I, I didn't make it through my childhood without scars, um, but I definitely uh, got a lot of competence and self-confidence and uh, feeling like I was, you know, in charge of my own life and, and um, could, you know, pa uh, 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 burn a path for myself. Amazing. And did you have some great mission at that point or you were just like, this is an adventure. I'm like jumping on for the ride and let's see what happens. You, you mean for, for fire? Yeah, when you're yeah, leaving no. university, I w I wanted to do um, First Amendment. I actually worked. Uh, I did work for one year, uh, part only part time at a law firm, doing patent law. Um, even though like I just like science, I, I, don't, I don't actually have a formal science background. Um, and while looking for a First Amendment job, and uh, but then uh, despite looking, fire kind of fell in my lap, um, and. It's an intense job. It's a hard job. Um, but my God, I love the team of people I've been able to help put together at FIRE and the kind of people who are attracted to genuinely nonpartisan defense of freedom of speech. Um, they're just inspiring to work with. And, it, I, you know, I was one of – I think I was one of five staffers when I was hired. And now we're – and I think we're a half a million dollar organization – we're now a 35-ish million dollar organization with about 120 staffers and getting bigger every day. Um, but the best thing about it is the people I get to work with, like the kind of people who are like – who won't bat an eye about taking on a case that will be so unpopular that we know we'll lose donors. We don't think twice about it. Like it, it, it's like, is it right? We take it. Um, and, you know, and that can that lead to situations where you find yourself waking up at night wondering if you might have to, you know, um, cut back or uh, eliminate some employees. Um, yeah. But after a while, donors start getting it's like, listen, you're never going to make us not take a case um, that you don't like. So don't try. Um, and that's the harder way to go. The easier way to go as a nonprofit is to be explicitly partisan. Um, and to, you know, like I, I always joke, but you know, I'm not really joking, um, that if I wanted to do that, we would have been a hundred million dollar organization, uh, 15 years ago, 10 years ago, at least. Um, but we didn't want to go that way. We wanted to go the harder way, which is we don't have a, um, a donor, uh, what, what's the word, a donor profile, like the kind of people who donate to fire 
um, are o- all over the political spectrum. We've had a little bit of a harder time getting into the um, more liberal leaning foundation space, um, but I kind of blame some, some of the more left leaning foundations for that. I've been told directly by some of the heads of these that, yeah, it's just you know some of the pro cancel culture younger staffers you know would be mad if they gave us money, which I think is um, a blight on them, not us. Um, but when it comes to our actual donors, um, like individual donors, which is 70 percent of what we make, it's all over the spectrum. It's a lot of old school ACLU people. It's a lot of um, you know center left and, and, and even pretty hard left people who still believe in freedom of speech. So you know it, it's, it, it, it's, it's exhausting work sometimes, um, but it's also one of the great privileges of my life. And it's basically like there'll always be work to do in defending. <laughs> yeah. Um, now, do I have hope that maybe one day we could be smaller than we are uh, because free speech will be so well protected? Um, probably not smaller than we currently are. I think even just the watchdog function of defending freedom of speech, even if that was all we were doing rather than some of the educational functions that we do, we'd still have to be at least as big as we are now. Um but do I have hope that things won't always be quite this bad? Um, and, you know, they, they do seem to be improving a bit. But I think people are underestimating how many reforms you'd need to see in higher education until you stop start stop seeing, you know, professors and students getting such regular trouble for what they what they believe or say. And And to be clear, people get in trouble on campuses all the time for opinions that – Regular Americans wouldn't bat an eye at. They're like, I don't even understand how you could have found that offensive. Um, but you know, I've been doing this for twenty three years now, and they find a way. Mm. And it, yeah, it's so interesting on that left wing point. Of course, for anyone who is thinking like, oh, this is like an ultra right. This is just protecting like Nazis or something. It's like, well, it was like McCarthyism wasn't that long ago when it was like the Marxists who were being. So it's really not about like a left or right wing thing yeah. um well it, yeah and and that's something that's been frustrating is that you know i growing up in the 80s and 90s um part of being um the uh of being a liberal meant being pro-freedom of speech um but today um i feel like the the kind of more old-fashioned campus left has sort of reasserted itself. And even since the 1960s, some aspects of the sort of Marcusean left have been pretty hostile to freedom of speech for people they disagree with. Um, They, of course, really like it for themselves. Um, But, you know, fire defends people all over the political spectrum all the time. Um, and, uh, and anybody who actually takes the time to look into us, you know, realizes pretty fast that we've always stood up for our principles. Amazing. Okay. I could ask you a million more questions, but, um, you have to go. So is there anything, <laughs> wait, I'll just ask you the last three questions and then we can talk about how people can support the mission. Last three questions? Whatever. Okay. Yeah. Got they're it. quick. Okay. What, how do you stay grounded? Kids. Uh, my kids. Is there a book that's had the biggest impact on your life? What a wonderful question. I read constantly, um, so much so that I just started doing a book of the month thing f- just for my own happiness. You know, I, you know, uh, Crime and Punishment's my all time favorite book. Um, uh, uh, sorry, fiction book. You know, as I said, comic books have had a disproportionate effect on my life. Honestly, like all I can say when it comes to, you know, favorite books or or influential books is like what I'm currently, you know, the most excited about. And I think I think my book of the month this month is going to be Matt Ridley's uh, The Evolution of Everything, um, which is, you know, making the argument that centralization of power, you know, um, Everybody in the elite assumes that that's the way we get progress, and that's just not the way we actually get progress. Cool. Okay. And what three words describe the best version of Greg? Oh, my goodness. What a great question. Well, hopefully, um, playful, um, 
loyal and imaginative. Beautiful. Okay, and then how can where can people find your books? How can people learn more about fire? How can people support? What do you want people to know? Uh, thefire.org, you know, is is where you find fire. Um, and, you know, we definitely uh, could use your support uh, because, you know, fighting free speech for free speech from a genuinely nonpartisan position can be a thankless job. Um, my substack is called The Eternally Radical Idea. Um, and definitely, you know, I, 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 uh, that's, I can't believe I'm actually writing weekly for something again. Um, but I've been able to reach a lot of people doing that. Um, so those are, and I'm, I'm G Lukianoff on, on, on Twitter as well. Amazing. Thanks so much. Thank you, Delia. And, and, uh, have fun visiting, uh, uh, the States. Hey guys, thanks for listening to this conversation. Feel free to share it with someone if you think that would get something out of it. And um, you can also subscribe or follow the podcast so then you find out about new episodes and purely for my own ego. No, just kidding. I think it actually helps the algorithm and helps um, more people find the podcast if you want to rate or review. Like, go for it. And see you next time.